Here I've got a nice geometry problem that's set in the complex plane. So let's see how this goes. So let's suppose that alpha and beta are in the complex plane, and not only are they complex numbers, but they lie on the unit circle. So generally, the unit circle is thought not only to be a circle of radius one, but also centered at the origin. So I've drawn a picture right here. And then I've built some of the rest of the problem into this picture. So we want to consider the lines that are tangent to alpha and beta. So I've drawn those in pink and in this peach color as well. And then our final goal is to find a nice formula for this intersection point gamma in terms of alpha and beta. And so just to maybe put it all together, we want to find the intersection point of these tangent lines that are tangent to the unit circle at points alpha and beta. And if you guys would like to see more complex analysis type stuff, although this isn't quite complex analysis, this is like complex arithmetic with geometry, but you can look at my second channel, Math Major, where I'm building an entire course in complex analysis. Okay, so let's get to this problem. The first thing that we'd like to do is to find an equation for each of these tangent lines. But if we find an equation for the tangent line for alpha, we immediately have one for the tangent line at beta just by replacing alpha with beta. Okay, so let's maybe say that we want to do that first. So equation of tangent at the point alpha, which is on the unit circle. And it goes without saying that I'm saying the tangent to the unit circle. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, we need to find out the direction of this tangent line. So the notion of the direction of the tangent line would be like a vector pointing in the direction of the tangent line if we were talking about R2 or vector calculus, or it would be like the slope if we were talking about single variable calculus. But direction is just given by a complex number if we're talking about a single complex variable. Okay, so how can we find that? Well, we'll use this kind of really well-known geometric fact that the tangent line to a circle is always perpendicular to the radius of a circle to, or to a radius of a circle. So if we take a radius from the origin to this point alpha, so that would just be a line segment from uh, zero to alpha. We know that that is going to be a perpendicular line segment to this tangent line. And so this line extending out of this line segment is in the direction of alpha. So we need to find something per perpendicular to alpha. But we can do that by rotating alpha by 90 degrees. So if we rotate alpha by 90 degrees or pi over two radians, then we're good to go and we have a direction for this tangent line. But it's well known in complex variables that multiplication by the number i provides a rotation by 90 degrees. So that tells us we have a direction for our tangent line given by i times alpha. Okay, well, we can talk through that a little bit. Notice if we multiply any real number by i, we end with a pure imaginary number. And that rotates this from the real axis up to the imaginary axis. For instance, the number 3, which would be out here, multiplied by i would be 3i, which is up there. That's a 90 degree rotation. Then furthermore, the number 3i multiplied by i would give us 3i squared or negative 3, which would be back here. That's another rotation by 90 degrees. So you can see that that most definitely works on the axes, but in, it in fact works anywhere in this complex plane. Okay, so we've got a direction for our tangent line, and we also have a point on the tangent line. So this is a point, this is a direction, so that means we can parametrize this tangent line. So if z is on this tangent line, so I'll just say z on the tangent line at alpha, that means that z must satisfy the following equation. So it's equal to alpha plus i times alpha times t, where t is some real number. So I'll just write it's some real number. So I think we can talk through that a little bit pretty easily. So notice alpha 
the alpha right here just takes us from the origin to this point along the line. And then I alpha tells us that we're going in this direction. And then that T tells us how far we're going. So for instance, if we take T to be maybe negative something, just because of how I rotates in this direction, we would get something down here. So this would be an example of alpha plus I times alpha T where T is negative. But then something up here would be an example of uh, alpha plus I times alpha T when T is positive. Okay, so anyway, we've got um, at least a Z value for this equation, but maybe we could also remove the parameter. In other words, write this without the parameter T. That would maybe be a little bit nicer. So maybe the first thing we'd like to do is maybe take the complex conjugate. That'll turn this I into a negative I, which looks like it would be along the way to get rid of the T. So Z bar will be alpha bar. Recall that alpha is a complex number. Minus I times alpha bar times T. Minus I because that's the conjugate of, al of I. And then alpha bar because we still need a conjugate of alpha. T is real, so that means that we don't need to conjugate that. So now looking at this, we see that we have a minus I alpha bar instead of a minus I alpha. We'd really like a minus I alpha. There's actually a bit of a trick to go from alpha bar to alpha, and that will use the fact that the modulus of alpha is one. How do we know the modulus of alpha is one? Because it lies on the unit circle. So we hadn't used that yet. So let's multiply this entire equation by alpha squared. We'll see why by alpha squared when we work it out. So this is going to give us alpha squared times z bar um, equals, let's see, the modulus of alpha squared times alpha. So I take one of these alphas, multiply the alpha bar, that gives me the modulus of alpha squared, and I use the other one just on its own. And then the same thing over here. So this is gonna be minus i modulus of alpha squared times alpha times t. But now, like I said, we're gonna use the fact that the modulus of alpha squared equals, what did I say, one? So that gives us alpha squared z bar equals alpha minus i times alpha t. So now let's rewrite this down here just so that we can see how we'll use it. So we have z equals alpha plus i alpha t. So that's actually really good news because what do we have here? Well, we've got something with a plus i alpha t and something with a minus i alpha t. So if we sum these, we will in fact get rid of the parameter. And so let's do that exactly. So if we take the sum of these two equations, we have um, alpha squared times z bar plus z equals 2 times alpha. And that's a nice closed formula without a parameter for all of the z values along this tangent line to the circle at alpha, which means we can get a similar equation right here for the tangent to the circle at beta just with beta um, replaced with alpha or alpha replaced be with beta. So the other one will be beta squared z bar plus z equals two beta. So the alpha one is for this line, the beta one is for this line. So if we're looking for gamma, which is the intersection, that means it must lie on both lines. So that means we have to solve this system of equations right here for z, which is exactly what we'll do at the next board. So far, we've determined that this intersection point gamma must satisfy the following system of equations. So we've got alpha squared z bar plus z equals 2 alpha and beta squared z bar plus z equals 2 beta. From here, we'd like to maybe solve for either z or z bar. Looks like it's gonna be a little bit easier to solve for z bar, so that's what we'll do. We'll take these two equations and then subtract the second from the first. So let's see, that'll give us alpha squared minus beta squared times z bar equals two times alpha minus beta. Okay, but that means that z bar is equal to two times alpha minus beta over alpha minus beta times alpha plus beta. Where here we're factoring this difference of squares using the standard factorization technique. 
But now we can make a simplification. This alpha minus beta will cancel this alpha minus beta. Notice, of course, we're only allowed to divide if alpha squared is not equal to beta squared. So that tells us that we can't find the intersection point when, like I said, alpha squared is equal to beta squared. Maybe tell me what that takes out of our ability over here. Maybe post that in the comments. And then that means we're left with uh, z bar equals 2 over alpha plus beta. But that's not really helpful because that's z bar and our solution gamma will be the z value. But we can take the conjugate of both sides and taking the conjugate of both sides will give us our solution. So that will be z equals 2 conjugate, which is 2, over alpha conjugate plus beta conjugate. But now we'll use the fact that alpha times alpha bar is equal to 1, like we saw before, and beta times beta bar is also equal to 1, to multiply the numerator and the denominator by alpha beta. That gives me with 2 alpha beta in the numerator. Like I said, alpha times alpha bar is 1, so that leaves me with beta. And likewise for beta times beta bar, so we have alpha plus beta in the denominator which means if we rename this to be our intersection point, we have our final solution for our intersection point, which has a pretty nice format. It's gamma equals two alpha beta over alpha plus beta. And that's a good place to stop.